This month, we're incredibly um, fortunate to welcome two outstanding Iranian Americans who are active in um, pioneering fields that we don't often hear about. So we're incredibly pleased to um, be able to converse with them today and to learn more about how they're advancing education and development of not only the Iranian community, but the worldwide community. Um, before we begin, I want to draw your attention to uh, our social media through Persia Educational Foundation. As you know, we publicize all our webinar and our um, scholarship and other programs, all the details on our social media and our website. And over the past two months, we've been sharing information about um, uh, our presenters today. So um, without uh, taking any more of your time, I just want to briefly um, say a few words about um, our panelists. We're delighted to welcome Mr. Rob Sobhani, who is an outstanding business executive and an international policy expert. He's the founder and CEO of an entity named Sparrow, which is a Microsoft partner company in the field of philanthropy. And what they do is they democratize philanthropic activities, which is a wonderful gift to humanity, particularly at this juncture in our history. Our second panelist today is a young talent, a Forbes recognized leading entrepreneur in the field of government technology. Um, Naim Hanjani is a person that um, has been recognized and, and is doing a great deal as a young Iranian who has immigrated to the United States recently and is following in the footsteps of pioneers and wonderfully accomplished individuals such as Mr. Sobhani. So without taking any more of your time, I would like to now turn to Mr. Sobhani and invite him to please say a few words. Mr. Sobhani, we're delighted to have you and we'd love to hear a little bit about what brought you to the world of policy and, and what it is that gives you your passion and your drive for doing so much for humanity. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm really, really, truly honored to be here today uh, as part of this panel. Thank you, Tahir Khanum, for inviting me. And I'm truly honored to have Naeem with my side. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm honored, really. Naeem is, is not just an entrepreneur. He's a man with a big heart and a rare gem. So it's an honor to be with Naeem as well. Um, if I were to summarize what brought me into this, I would say it was when I was born in 1960 in Kansas, my esophagus was attached to my lungs and I was about to die, literally. And so my mother has always reminded me there was a purpose for you in life because you were about to die when you were young. Um, and so uh, my philosophy is life's not a dress rehearsal. And you have to leave this a better world than the, what you found it. And so whether it was doing energy work in the country of Azerbaijan and marrying philanthropy to the work of companies that I was working with, or fast forward to what we're doing today uh, in partnership with Microsoft, to which you alluded to democratizing philanthropy and really uniting the world around philanthropy. Um, you know, this is something that I'm extremely passionate about and happy to Sorry about that intrusion. Um, thank you very much. That's that's fantastic to hear that uh, you know you were born to bring good to to this world, um, and it's wonderful to hear how your dear mother framed your early childhood suffering as a path to prosperity for yourself and your society. So, with that in mind, would you like to tell us a little bit about? what you've been doing in the private sector and, and the spirit of innovation that, that drives your work? So um, absolutely. Let me just give you a story briefly. So the year is 1997. It is the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, I'm in Azerbaijan. I get invited by the president of Azerbaijan to go to his office. He's desperate. 
He says, I need assistance. Well, Mr. President, what do you need assistance for? The Soviet health system had collapsed. He needed immediate inoculation for thousands of children in Azerbaijan. And so he asked me to help him out. So I got on a plane, I went to Chicago, I met with the CEO of Amoco, and I said, listen, here's an opportunity to do good and benefit from you know, the prospect of uh, an energy uh, project in Azerbaijan. He stepped up to the plate, he donated $100,000. We leveraged that 100,000 into a million dollars in vials for inoculating the children of Azerbaijan. The joy was being on that plane from Chicago to Baku, landing, distributing the vials and inoculating the children. And at that moment in 1997, it dawned on me that if companies do good, there is a reward for them on the business side. Hence, fast forward to what we're doing today with Microsoft. What we are going to, what we are planning to do with Microsoft is really uniting the world around philanthropy. Um, our flagship product is a e-commerce tool that can go on the shopping cart of any merchant anywhere in the world. Uh, think of it as Amazon Smile for the entire non-Amazon universe. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and so with, with, with our partnership with Microsoft, what we want to do is give the ability to a shopper in London who's shopping on Marks and Spencer to at checkout choose a charity in India or Indianapolis, or for Mrs. Johnson, who's shopping in Texas, to donate to a Texas food bank or to a pre-approved nonprofit in Iran that is helping the children in Sistan Baluchestan. So that's our mission, that's our vision, and so that's what we're doing this as we speak today. So this is one means through which you're, you're um, uh, promoting the democratization of access to economic wealth, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the idea is to, um, it may be interesting for your viewers, in America, each day, we donate a billion dollars to charity. That's only 45% of the population. <clears throat> So what we want to do is increase that number, but more importantly, as I said, give the ability to people across the globe to start forming this community around philanthropy, around doing good. What we call it is purchase with a purpose. That is a wonderful, wonderful concept. Um, as, as part of this process, of course, we need to have a huge deal of transparency for, for things to, to succeed. So maybe this is where we could come to you, Naim John. What is it that you feel um, about the importance of, why do you think it's so important to have transparent societies in order to have greater level of democ democracy and prosperity? Sure, um, just wanted to say a few words before I start. Thank you all for um, having me today. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to be here and, um, Dear Rob, thank you for the kind words. Um, why transparent societies are better suited to deliver prosperity? So that's a very vast topic for us to talk about. Um, so there's, you know, just to make it very brief, knowledge is power. Residents of free and transparent societies have the civic ability to hold their leaders accountable. Transparency encourages decision makers to consider an equity minded approach where we can um, also, we can see the government, like, you know, here in the US, we can see the government requesting public feedback on regulations and policies to identify how it would um, be of greatest use to the public. Very important to acknowledge that prosperous societies are able to maintain economic security and opportunity for all and transparency is the key to driving that motivation. And, um, but, 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 but what we can see that even, even though we are fortunate to live 
in a transparent society, most individuals do not know where and what information they have, they are able to access. And as a result of transparency, um, there should be more awareness as um, dear Rob was talking about earlier, and we should create and like, you know, the platforms of, you know, what, inform what information is transparent to the public and how it helps to deliver prosperity. One project that a few years ago I worked on was a platform that was created to keep citizens informed about their activities, about the activities their elected officials were involved in. And um, the results of those activities were and how, you know, what, what, what was the result of those activities and how to get in touch with them. But the majority of the data, that's a separate conversation that we can, uh, we can talk about, the majority of that data is publicly available, but may but may not be easy to find. Um, so that's make you know I, you know I don't want to take too much of time about talking about transparency, but very briefly, well, it's an incredibly important topic, increasingly so in our world today. So I think that has a great deal of impact, not only just on creating um, greater levels of prosperity and access to resources, but actually on policy making, which of course, Mrs. Sopani, you've been you are a veteran of for 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 a long time um given your experiences is 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 based in the us would it be possible for you to maybe give us a couple of examples about us foreign policy but really just focusing more on 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 the global platform for policy and how and when decisions are made and what impact really they they have on individuals but also in reverse perhaps um what influence can individuals have on these decision making processes that that allow for certain policies to come into existence and impact the spaces that we're operating in so i think it also relates very briefly to what naeem was talking about which was transparency um to give you two very concrete examples because it does relate to policy making and foreign policy you look at uh the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway. Uh, the Norwegian economic engine was the sale of energy uh, through which now they have one of the world's most transparent sovereign wealth funds. The citizens of Norway can access a portal, see where their money is being spent. They can, as citizens of their country, have influence over decisions that the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund makes. And it's interesting because today with the issue of climate change, they, the citizens of Norway have forced the Sovereign Wealth Fund to set aside 20% for climate change. Now, you contrast that to, for example, Iran, where the regime is not as transparent, unfortunately. And so, Iranian citizens don't have access to a portal that allows them to, in a live feed, see where that oil is being sold or where the budget of the country is being allocated. So Naeem mentioned you know, uh, a, a technology that he has developed, which is at the heart of transparency. We as American citizens can now, me as, as a resident of Virginia, can find out what my Senator John Warner voted on in terms of lifting the label of revolutionary guard on the Iranian regime or not, okay? And then if he does, I can knock on his door. I can go down, to, down the street to Capitol Hill, knock on John Warner's door, probably even demand a meeting with him. So you, you ask about how foreign policy is made. It's made at the granular level to a certain extent with citizens like myself knocking on the door of senators, but the tools that I use are the tools that Naeem has created, which is the technology platform that allows me in an instant to know what Senator Warner voted on, what Senator Kane voted on at the micro level. At the more general level, American foreign policy, of course, is informed by a myriad and multitude of factors. Think tanks have influence. 
members of Congress have influence. And let's not forget the recipients of that foreign policy. So, you know, the, the government of Azerbaijan or Qatar or Saudi have some influence over the direction of foreign policy. I hope I've answered the question. Beautifully, beautifully. Maybe then this is a good time for us to hear from Naeem about the platform that you refer to. Naeem, what is this platform that you've created that enables citizens to have a greater voice in formulation and delivery of policies? Sure, I have less to share about foreign policy, but more about technology and government. So the role of technology in policy making process. Um, information technology has advanced uh, development in the public sector. This is what we have seen in the past several years. Also, technology has modernized public affairs and government affairs, and it is now more fast paced than ever. Um, especially public affairs professionals now have the tools they need to be successful in a very competitive environment from access to real time data related to legislation or, and regulations um, to up to date contact information and a stakeholder management on when to reach out to, who to reach out to. And um, the public affairs software company that I lead enhance, enhances workflow for policy professionals through technology. While this concept isn't new in industries like finance and product management, the streamlining, streamlining um, workflow is very new in policy making and essential to um, public affairs teams. We, like, you know, if just briefly mentioning some of the features that we, you know, we offer in our platform, we deliver critical legislative and regulatory data and insights in an uncertain world by combining AI, machine learning, and other technology, other technologies with um workflow tools and expert research we reinvent the way that organizations minimize risks and take on opportunities associated with rapidly changing policy environment i know that when i share about the the way that our platform works might be a little bit confusing so i will start with one example as businesses and organizations expand their operations into more jurisdictions, they may become exposed to additional laws and regulations, which generally are growing in complexity. Um, for example, a writer company like Uber, operating in both the United States and Europe, is subject to sets of labor regulations, which those individual countries, the company must also comply with diverging laws in various states and other localities, as well as monitor policymaking that could result in new regulations. Changes in the laws and regulations applicable to the rights of businesses and the industry as a whole could create risks, but also opportunities impacting the company's strategies, affecting the company's financial results, and could expose the company to um, legal risk. And um, adding to that a specific example, the recent survey from a consulting firm, PwC, stated that approximately 1,500 global CEOs reported that regulatory and policy issues are the biggest threats to their businesses. Without a platform to efficiently manage and monitor legislation and regulations, businesses and organizations may become exposed to potential damage to their um, brands, reputations, and even financial performance. And so this is not only policymakers that they have to have access to, set, to some you know, so platforms like ours, but also corporations and individuals that are influencing policymakers. They should have access to certain information. And the way that we do, we, we, you know, we often share that we democratize access to information. Majority of the data is publicly available, but it's hard to find. It, will, it, it might be very time consuming for you know, corporations or average citizens to have access to that data. So then how does the technology that you're bringing to our world today, how does it advance grassroots ability to advocate for its rights um, globally and, and, and locally and nationally? Can you tell us a little bit more? Because the point that you made that 
the information is available, it's hard to, to, to find and to act on. So how does this technology that you talk about make this change? Mm -hmm. So that could be a different feature. That's an advocacy feature. So the one that I was just sharing briefly about influencing policy, like, you know, map, track, legislation, regulation, and like, you know, um, being in touch with the right members of Congress, like the right policy advisors to be able to influence and like, you know, being, you know, to have the opportunity to get in touch with them. But um, back to the advocacy, um, the grassroots advocacy, Information technology um, unlock the potential for people to be more connected than ever. Um, we have seen advocates apply grassroots organization organizing the um, internet and social media platforms with amazing results. So many campaigns were successful in advocating for human rights in Iran via Twitter and or other social media platforms that we have seen in the past few years or uh, we started to see the trend of grass, grassroots advocacy with Black Lives Matter advocacy in 2014. And another example is the globalization of advocacy with young online advocates on climate change awareness for the past few years. So we have seen like the advocacy feature, how it could be very important. And um, if I could, elaborate a little bit more advocacy feature um, on the company that I lead in particular, our advocacy tools empower citizens and, organi and organizations to connect with the governments. We provide solutions that enable organizations from corporations to nonprofits to trade associations to build campaigns, um, engage with advocates and educate lawmakers through multiple channels. Our tools also enable customers to track campaign performance with real-time actionable reports and insights with data-driven recommendations for improved performance based on the industry specific, you know, that they are in. Um, a few examples that, again, I could share maybe. Um, a national trade association can advance advocacy work through a digital strategy after decades of trying to keep up in the industry or a congressional office can use outreach tools engage in a meaningful and coordinated fashion with a constituents through surveys newsletters and mailing tools and um, so that's that's very briefly about some of the features that we have on our platform that's amazing that's amazing congratulations on on thinking about filling this gap in our world and and coming up with such an amazing uh, uh, resource uh, Mr. Subhani, um, you're, you're a successful businessman. So one question that at the moment is occupying the minds of so many around the world is the issue of um, democratically engaging in wealth creation. What are your thoughts on that process? What are the innovative approaches that you feel need further exploration and pioneering commitments to make sure that um, we improve the world we live in? That's a fantastic question. And that's really at the core of what we are doing in our collaboration with Microsoft is figuring out technologies that we can leverage for the common good. Uh, more importantly, and specifically, how do we create technologies that allow access, equal access to capital? Not everyone has access to Silicon Valley. Not everyone has access to the Gates Foundation. Not everyone has access to the Ford Foundation. So how do you democratize wealth creation, right? For me personally, this is the most exciting technology that I'm working on currently with our team and with Microsoft to build because for me, the applications in Iran are enormous. And why do I emphasize Iran? I'm on the board of a battery company founded whose chief scientist is an Iranian lady. I'm on the board of an AI company that has beat Google, Amazon, Facebook to explainable AI, Iranian gentlemen, okay? This is a nation full of talent. The majority of that talent is in Iran. So how do we allow access to the millions of Iranians inside Iran 
to come to a platform that we hopefully someday can build and say, give us your idea. Yes, my idea is to uh, take care of ear infections and it is maybe Sanaz from Shahrud, right? Now Sanaz from Shahrud eventually can come onto our platform, give us her idea, tell us how much money she needs and we vet, we make sure Sanaz, you know, is going to deploy that capital properly. But now Sanaz and the Sanazes of Iran can have the opportunity to help solve ear infection. And maybe Jafar in Sanandaj can solve water purification. That is how we democratize wealth creation. So these examples you're giving are absolutely real. They, they are out there. Um, like Naeem, we have so many young, talented Iranians um, who are in Iran or like him have recently moved to the West and, and have an amazing ability um, to, to address the challenges that exist in Iran and among the Iranian community because we're now a worldwide community. So what you're talking about, how real is it? Does it exist? Can, can they actually do it? How do young people connect with you? This is a question that actually when we posted your um, uh, uh, bi biographies on our site, there were a number of people saying, how do you connect with these two individuals, particularly yourself, Mr. Sohani? So how can people actually come to you now and make this happen? Is the ability there? So since the topic was transparency, and I think truthfulness is the foundation of human virtue, it's important to also say, we are building the platform. It's not complete yet, okay? So one of the things we're doing with our partnership with Microsoft is building the platform, making sure that on the foundational side, cybersecurity issues are addressed, making sure that you know the portal is not abused. So we are building the platform, but I promise you as I'm standing here um, on May 11 at 1230 Eastern time that once it's done, this is the gift of Naims of the world, myself to the people of Iran. This is going to be our gift to the people of Iran because this is a talented group of people who unfortunately, because of you know, circumstance, are not able to blossom. Naeem has blossomed in America. Why? Because America allows for his talent to blossom. We want the Sanazes of the world, the Gol Sanaz of the world, the Jamshids of the world in Iran to blossom. And that's what I'm promising once the platform is built. It's not built yet, but once it's built, that is going to happen, mark my word. That's amazing. That's, that's I think, um, one of the challenges that we have with younger Iranians in Iran is uh, that their hope and their vision needs to be restored. And so what you're offering, I think, is, is the first glimmerings of a platform of many forms of hope, which is much appreciated. And I think more power to you for even thinking of this. And so that brings me to another question. What do you feel, both of you are now um, you know, among diaspora, one for a longer period than the other, but what do you feel is the role of Iranian diaspora in addressing the challenges that exist in Iran and among Iranians. Those are two different categories because again, one is limited geographically, the other isn't. But what is our role in the reconstruction and redevelopment of 21st century Iran? I'll let Naeem uh, address it first. Sure. Um, so, Maybe I add a few things to what Mr. Sopani was talking about, and then I try to um, answer, you know, to be, you know, to share some thoughts on what, what you just said. The role of, overall, the role of philanthropy in our society as well. Um, so there are many answers to this question, as Mr. Sopani was talking, but from my perspective, philanthropy is private action in the public interest, demonstrating our faith that individuals 
have the capacity to create wealth, but also have the ability to voluntarily care for their country, their society and community. We have seen so many examples of that during pandemic that many wealthy individuals contributed back to the well-being of the society or what we see today that corporations or again wealthy individuals are uh, with the conflict of Russia and Ukraine they are contributing uh, with giving free internet access or with other ways to uh, help the victims in, 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 in that conflict. Um, but back to what I was talking about, philanthropists are able to lead their efforts and allow nonprofits and government agencies to focus on the actual groundwork. Neither could properly achieve their mission without the other. Um, a few examples that also could be applied even for the future of Iran or for like today, that that also this is something that we have seen here in the US, most universities and institutions of learning were founded as the result of philanthropic efforts. Education in the arts and sciences has allowed us to have great scientists and entrepreneurs, has created jobs, decision makers, uh, politicians and active members of our society. The wealthy have a tremendous responsibility to the human family one that can be seen as a path of service to the world of humanity. And this, this, this is going to continue. And like perhaps for the future of Iran, there are so many other initiatives like that. Like, you know, it could be even for healthcare, there are going to be, um, you know, um, assisting establishing hospitals or like education, which is the future of Iran. So um, to creating opportunity for all, not that certain level of society that have access to education, but also make it accessible for all. So there, so there are so many other elements that we could think of that uh, we could create a, um, you know, equal opportunity for, for, for all citizens of Iran, but, um, I will pass it to Mr. Sopani to, to share some thoughts on that too. Thank you, Naeem John. Um, you know, I, I'll start off by uh, pointing you to the photo behind me or the painting behind me. Um, this is one of the world's first Muslim philanthropists from Azerbaijan. His name is Zain al Abidin From 1880 to 1900, he endowed all the theaters and all the art collection in Azerbaijan. From 1900 till the Bolshevik revolution, he endowed schools for girls because he was a strong advocate for women's education, especially medical schools. He built the first medical school for women in Azerbaijan. So to Naeem's point, it's an individual act but for the common good. Now to answer your question about what the diaspora can do, we all have various um, strengths uh, and, and, and comparative advantages. So if there is an Iranian mechanical engineer who knows how to build the best solar panels, well, hallelujah, let's have him write, you know, and, and put together a plan for solar energy in Iran. And why am I putting my finger on solar energy in Iran? Because despite the fact that we have Kavire Lut, which is according to California Institute of Technology, the world's best location to put solar panels, the Iranian regime has not done anything in that front. But let me give you a stat. If you cover 10% of Kavide Lut with solar panels that have a layer of graphene on it, you can provide electricity for free to the people of Iran and export electricity to the region. Just 10% of Kavide Lut. So what is the responsibility of the diaspora? Come up with solutions, not repetition, of what's wrong in Iran. The people of Iran know what's wrong with Iran. They don't need to be reminded. They're looking for hope. So if you're a solar technology expert, 
Hallelujah. Let's have you talk about how to deploy solar. If you're an expert in battery, tell us how you would store batteries so solar and battery can go along together. You have 24 seven energy, right? Or if you're an expert in water purification, hallelujah, tell us how you would solve the water problem. So that in a nutshell to me is the way in which the diaspora can help. That's wonderful. Well, um, both of you have, have made fantastic references to the importance of education. Of course, Persia being an educational foundation uh, that is unique in certain aspects was a response of, of a diaspora Iranian family who saw it as their duty to not only enjoy the um, opportunities and freedoms that we have in the West, but to create a channel through which scholarships could be made available to uh, deserving Iranian students who are working so hard in some of the best Western universities. Um, one of the scholarships, of course, is, uh, is focused on technology, uh, promoting women in technology. That's the Persia Mirza Khani Scholarship for Women in STEM. Another is the Ansari Memorial Scholarship, which uh, advances uh, young Iranians in public uh, service and human rights, which is very much related to, to the spaces that we're referring to today. So one question that has come up, which kind of ties well from your focus on Iranians in the West doing our best for um, our, our country and our countrymen, the importance, the integral importance of education um, in promoting that, that spirit of service to our country and our countrymen. One last question that, that I think uh, begets a great deal of attention and has come from our participants just now, not, um, I'm going to maybe leave the rest of the questions that are coming through our other channels. But this question is very important. He's a student and is asking, what can I do as a student to, to advance my, my community and, and serve my society? Name, John, I'll let you answer it first. Well, in, at university, again, um, it could be different because where you are in the US, in Europe, or in Iran. Um, but in the US, I could share about my experience when I was, because, you know, as a Baha'i, I couldn't go to university back in Iran. So um, I didn't have to, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I didn't, I don't have that experience. So I can't share much about the university system in, 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 in Iran. But in the US, um, there are so many um, student um, coordinated clubs, organizations that you could join, you could contribute, you could take initiatives, but I see that they just sit from my chat. So this is something that I don't know because I'm not too familiar with the uh, university system in Iran, but this is very unfortunate when I'm saying it because um, the country that I was born in, so I, you know, I, was, I wasn't allowed to pursue my higher education. Um, not sure what would be the best answer. So I will pass it to Mr. Sopani while I can think about it a little bit more to see what potentially can be done in Iran in a university. So um, just off the top of my head, I mean, John, what I would suggest is if you can, either around the university where you're studying or somewhere in the city of Mashhad, get permission to get a plot of land and start planting cucumbers, organic cucumbers, organic tomatoes, any food product, any vegetables, and make that your community. And start providing that to your local markets, but also use it as a way to do your philanthropy, your part of work. I don't know what your degree's in, <clears throat> but to me, that would be something practical that you and your friends could do. Again, get a plot of land and start planting and growing organic vegetables for consumption by the local community in Mashat. Naim John, anything else come to your mind so far? So there, I mean, now that you know, I can think of because. Um, I know that there might be some sort of limitations back in Iran, in, in, in Iran uh, but I'm sure that like, you know, you have certain skills that you can um, 
you know, you can help other, you know, the community, if it could be for, with, here, I would call like, you know, accounting, like, you know, when we have to do our taxes, so we could reach out to like, you know, individuals with low income families, like, you know, this is what I know, this is something that I can help you with every year. But um, maybe you could just share some of your skill set with um, other members of the community um, in Mashhad in the region that you live. So this is something that I can think of on top of my head. But sorry, again, I can't share much about like, you know, what's happening, what's happening in Iran within the education system, because this is something that um, I've never experienced. Well, thank you very much for, for your transparency about your limitations name. And, and Mr. Sopony, of course, you, you, you were born and raised in the US, as you mentioned earlier. So um, this is very different. But from what I've understood from some of the young uh, Iranians from uh, Mashhad region who um, you know, have, have been in touch or have spoken in different uh, uh, spaces about the challenges that they face there. Um, the challenges have actually given birth to an amazing uh, and thriving um, uh, artistic and cultural community from what we understand. At the same time, there are a great deal of needs. There are a lot of people who have um, uh, other abilities, let's say, um, physically or mentally, that that require a great deal of attention. Of course, you know that's the part of the country that um, is receiving um, a number of of Afghans from the neighboring country. So there are a lot of opportunities in terms of how we serve uh, individuals who have different physical, physical or or mental need, needs. Um, you know, some of whom maybe maybe in the university the artistic and cultural expressions that are happening no doubt have a root in the universities there and, and the higher education institutions there. Um, so there are possibilities of doing things. And I think the example that Mr. Sopani gave is really relevant because with the way the price of food is going, the, the developments in the news recently in Iran with regards to um, rationing of food resources there is something that's quite worrying. And uh, the ability to, to, to produce the food that we need to eat um, is, is essential to, to our uh, basic human, you know, food is one of our five basic human rights, um, along with education, along with shelter and health and work. So if, if there is a space to um, engage, I know hydroponics is something that's really uh, taking off in, in Iran with regards to um, food product production. So that's maybe something to look into, but the, those are all abilities to uh, explore. Finally, I suppose to sort of uh, make a full circle and come back to what we were talking about with, with the all important issue of policy and policymakers. Um, if there is anything that can be done, you know, at, at the local level, at the regional level with policymakers, there are many people who are willing to um, explore um, uh, different ways of improving and serving the Iranian uh, society. So it's worth um, exploring those possibilities with, with the local charities. This is, it, it, this is why it's so interesting to me to hear what you're doing, Mr. Subhani, with, with uh, philanthropy, because the culture of philanthropy is something that, as you mentioned with the wonderful example behind you, um, goes back the notion of khayriye, is woven into uh, um, an identity that, that Iranians are very much familiar with. Um, so that's something that we could explore more and more. And I think you know, the younger generation of Iranians in Iran are doing a marvelous job of advancing um, khayriye and, and community service and community activities. So mm. it's, it's a wonderful, um, this is why I wanted to focus on this particular question. We've had other questions that have come our way but I think that we will have to bring those up in another opportunity with, with both of you, Mr. Sobhani and, um, and Naim John, uh, to discuss those particular issues that have more to do with Western and Iran um, policy relationships and fall outside the purview of this particular webinar. We're coming to the end of our time. I want to thank you again for accepting to, to do this with us. This is wonderful of you. And um, maybe just a few words that you would like to offer in conclusion. Uh, I'll let name John go first. One thing again, thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. I'm so glad that um, I was able to um, learn from Mr. Sopani and you and um, 
and to be able to share a few points. But back to what Mr. Sofani was talking about, this is specific um, example in, in Mashhad. If I have seen it, it's been a successful project in the US, in the UAE and other countries, community garden, as they call it. Um, if, if you're able to do it in, in Mashhad or the area that you live, it's an amazing uh, project. I have seen the results of it. Um, it could be very, um, you could bring other, you could see that after, after you do it, other individuals will be interested, they will be involved in the project. And you can, um, it's the easiest way to um, develop a few skills and uh, contribute back to the society. Um, but thank you again for, for having me today. Thank you for accepting to be with us. Mr. Sobhani, over to you. Um, I just want to um, end by saying your foundation um, is also keeping alive the legacy of a great man, the late Mr. Ansari. And Mr. Ansari and people like my father-in-law, who's 94 years old, were part of what was called point four. In the, 19, in the late 1940s and 1950s, they were the pioneers who built Iran. The late Mr. Ansari was one of those blocks that built modern Iran. Today we're 21st century. We can learn a lot from that legacy, but if we remain true to the legacy of Mr. Ansari, whose foundation, you are keeping that legacy alive. I have enormous hope for the future of Iran. Thank you very much for your kind words, which of course are, are directed to the, to the founding family of this foundation. I too share your admiration for their commitment to the betterment of Iran, whether they were in Iran or thousands of miles away from it. It is my honor and pleasure to, to be part of this foundation and to serve through it the Iranian community, and it's been an absolute pleasure to be in your company today. Thank you very much for giving us the treat of offering this uh, interesting webinar to our community. Thank you again, and we look forward to welcoming you during our June webinar. Please follow Persia social media and watch our website for further information, particularly with regards to our Mirza Khani scholarship, which result will be announced very soon. And of course, further information about our Ansari scholarship and other events. Thank you again, wishing you a wonderful day, week and month. See you in June, 2022. Thank you.